Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. lecture we begin by looking at the CD4 formula that we derived last time and we continue our discussion. Today we will additionally discuss about the wave number approach. Last time we had looked at the derivation of the CD4 scheme for first derivative. So, just to recapitulate, towards the end of the last lecture, we had even formally shown that why we have been able to achieve the fourth order accuracy formally through this approach, through the Taylor table based calculations that we showed and we remember that this particular column, which comes from the Fi 4 had yielded a 0, because all the terms summed up to 0 when we substituted the values of the coefficients a 1, a 2, a 3 and a 4 in the associated expressions in the f i 4 column, while the f i 5 column elements when they were uh, entries, when they were summed up with the values of the coefficients substituted which you can see here. So, this is a 1, this is a 2, a 3 and a 4 respectively and the other coefficients are essentially coming from these numbers which you have. So, you have 1 by factorial 5 which is 120, you have 2 to the power of 5 by factorial 5 which is 32 by 120 and so on and then you find that this does not sum to 0. So, this is a non-zero number what you produce over here and therefore, this column, these column uh, entries would lead to the leading order truncation error and that we showed it to be of the order of delta x to the power of 4, because we said that we have delta x to the power of 5 terms in the denominator and 1 by delta x coming from the coefficients and therefore, ultimately you will be left with fourth order accuracy. So, we have been successful in obtaining a fourth order accurate central difference formula using a 5 point stencil, which we had set out to achieve. Just to recapitulate, from the Taylor series approach, what we learnt was that this is a method by which we can quantify the formal order of accuracy of a scheme through the truncation error based approach and we also learned that the accuracy is essentially linked with mesh refinement. So, if we are refining the mesh or the grid that we are using for calculations by a factor of 2, it can improve the accuracy of a second order finite difference scheme fourfold, while if we are using a fourth order accurate scheme a twice fine mesh would improve the accuracy 16 times and that is the reason why one would actually uh, like to explore higher and higher order accuracies in a formal sense and try to apply them in grids of different refinements and trying to look at how the errors reduce and accuracy gets enhanced. 
So, even on a relatively coarse mesh, the CD4 scheme is expected to do com uh, comparatively better or quite significantly better than the CD2 scheme. So, that is primarily the motivation behind looking for higher order accuracy. Well, that is one possible way by which we can assess accuracy of a finite difference scheme, but that is not the only one. There could be an alternative method, which often turns out to be more effective than the formal order of accuracy, which we do by the Taylor series approach. And that approach is known as the modified wave number approach. And what we try to assess over here is that how well is a finite difference scheme doing in differentiating sinusoidal functions, which could include both sine as well as cosine terms. Now, the motivation behind doing such an exercise would be that we are all aware that Fourier series is a very, very powerful tool in representing arbitrary functions. And we often come across uh, very complex functional forms, uh, where the Fourier series approach is very robust and uh, uh, sometimes uh, the most effective way of representing such complex functional forms. And then, if we have a finite difference scheme uh, doing a good job in differentiating sine or cosine terms that occur in Fourier series, then we can be rest assured that they would be appropriate in uh, application of uh, finite differencing of complex functional forms. And uh, that basically gives the motivation of pursuing the modified wave number approach, where we try to look at the suitability of a finite difference scheme in differentiating sinusoidal functions. So, with that motivation in mind, we try to look at this alternative approach for assessing accuracy of a finite difference scheme, which we are naming as the wave number approach. Before we do more uh, detailed discussions on what the wave number approach actually means, let us look at some wave forms, some typical wave forms and uh, briefly relook at some of the facts that we know about wa such wave forms, so that we can formally address the issue of the wave number uh, approach. So, here in the diagram, we have a certain domain length L that we have specified, along which we can see uh, waves disposed. So, the blue colored wave completes two full wavelengths over that domain, while the green colored wave uh, ends up having many, many more wavelengths. Incidentally, both the waveforms are having integer number of wavelengths accommodated within the same length that is L. Now, the green wave has a very short wavelength while the blue wave has a comparatively long wavelength. So, what it means is that if you have a minimum length scale defined here, based on which you can accommodate the shortest possible wave, then you are essentially defining a bound. That means, you cannot express a wave, which has a shorter wavelength than the one that we have represented over here, provided that this interval 
is defined. So, here what we are trying to say is that if you have a domain length L which you are representing in the form of the small interval delta x times the number of intervals that you have, then that way you are also defining how short the wavelength can get, because you cannot have a wave which has a wavelength more than 2 delta x on such a discretized domain. Now, we have a wave number associated with these waves. The blue and the green wave would have very different wave numbers associated with them. So, by definition we say that the number of wavelengths that can be accommodated within a length of 2 pi would give you the wave number. So, by definition if you have a wave, a sinusoidal wave, of wavelength lambda, then the wave number of such a wave will be given by 2 pi by lambda. Now, when the interval is not 2 pi in length, but rather some other length like we are calling as L over here and we are seeing that small n number of wavelengths can be accommodated within such a length, then obviously, the lambda corresponding to such a wave will become L by n and this n is a general quantity. It can be applicable for a, a long wavelength wave or a medium wavelength wave or could be a very short wavelength well, uh, wave as well. So, n is a kind of a variable. So, that will essentially mean that you end up producing waves of different wavelengths by tuning the value of n. So, if you combine these two equations, the equation for lambda here and the equation of wave number that we already defined earlier, then we end up getting an expression for wave number of this kind, which gives you k is equal to 2 pi small n by L. And now, we have to decide what is the range of values of n that we can accommodate. So, that the, the necessary condition is that whichever way we accommodate in the process within this domain L, the wave should end up completing integer number of wavelengths within the domain length L. It cannot be a portion of the wave left at the end of the domain which is not completed. So, if you look back at the picture on top, you can very clearly see that both the blue as well as well as the green colored waves have ended up satisfying that condition. You could have more number of waves of intermediate wavelengths which could be coming in between based on how the value of small n changes. Now, coming to the range of values that we have for small n, if small n is equal to 0 that yields the condition that k will become equal to 0. Now, if k is equal to 0 that means, the function is not showing any wavy nature whatsoever, it is just a constant. Whereas, if n is equal to 1 then you will end up just filling up the entire length L through one wave length. That means, if this is your L, then you will see a sinusoidal wave going like this and filling up the domain, which is a fairly large wavelength wave. Now, gradually as you keep increasing n and bring it to a large value, if, if the capital N value is a large value, then n by 2 is also quite large. In that case, you will have waves with much higher wave numbers which will look closer to the green one that you have. In fact, the green one satisfies the condition that n is equal to capital N by 2, because the green one is the limiting case where 
one wavelength is accommodated within 2 delta x length. That means, half of the wave gets accommodated within the smallest length scale that is available in the discrete space, which we are offering offer referring as the grid spacing like the way we did it on a finite difference mesh for example. So, this was the grid spacing that we were talking about when we did the finite difference calculations. So, it is a very similar sense that we are trying to convey over here. So, if this length L was discretized using a set of grid points, then delta x is the grid spacing that we have and you can accommodate the shortest possible wave which has a wavelength of 2 delta x on such a grid. So, we are just re-emphasizing this point here in the boxed right up here that the shortest wave has a very highly oscillatory nature and this is the shortest wave we can accommodate within the given grid with this wavelength 2 delta x wavelength and that gives you the highest value of the wave number k max. Similarly, we said that for n is equal to 0, we have no functional variation, there is no modulation that we see in the functional value in space. So, these are the two ends of the spectrum. Now, this concept will be very useful when we develop the modified wave number approach for assessing the accuracy of a finite difference scheme. We will just try to look at a few points before we go over to the wave number approach. So, we have understood that a large number of grid points will be required when we try to capture uh, you know high frequency sinusoidal function um, within a discrete space, where you have a certain length discretized using a, a large number of grid points. And then, if you are trying to differentiate such a wave uh, function, then you also of course, need very accurate differencing methods. Uh, when you have a given set of grid uh, points or grid resolution, uh, you need to assess that whether the finite difference scheme that you are using is capable of capturing the high frequency part of the sinusoidal functions effectively, because it is expected that the low frequency parts uh, will be captured with more efficiency, because they are associated with slowly varying functions, while the high frequency part is uh, rapidly varying functions and capturing them through uh, the difference operations may be very challenging. And therefore, uh, the accuracy of the scheme from the wave number approach would be to focus on this that how effective is a numerical scheme in capturing high frequency oscillatory behavior of functions. And we need to remember that we have in the earlier part of this course discussed more on uh, linear differential equations, but very often in fluid mechanics we have to handle nonlinear differential equations. Very often they are also going to be of partial differential nature and uh, it would be found that such differential equations contain a large number of frequencies they could be several frequencies at least. And therefore, the finite difference scheme should have enough capability to resolve the different frequencies which would be there in the solution with sufficient efficacy, without which the solutions will not be satisfactory. Going to a more formal way of setting up the stage for doing the wave number approach, we first introduce a harmonic function of period L and we introduce it in a complex form, a complex representation, because very often it is more convenient to 
represent a harmonic function that way because you can accommodate the sine and cosine terms more compactly through uh, a complex representation. And we are going to show both the analytical as well as the discrete form of such a function here. So, first looking at the analytical form, we are defining the function small f is equal to e to the power of capital I k x. Here, we are using capital I as under root minus 1. Usually, we use a small i for doing that, but because we have exhausted the small i for meaning grid index, here we are going to call the under root minus 1 as capital I. And this is essentially going to cater to uh, a large number of waves, possible waves having different wave numbers. So, in Fourier series representations for example, we could be having some coefficient terms also coming on over here, but we are not including them, but we will be looking at behavior of such coefficients later on in a future lecture where we deal more on stability analysis. So, as far as the modified wave number approach is concerned, we will not be needing the coefficient term and therefore, we are not including it here. We recall the Euler formula where we can have representation of this e to the power of i k x in terms of the cosine and the sine terms. And we may often come up across even with e to the power of minus i k x. So, we also need to recall the form for that. Now, we need to remember that this is an analytical form which is uh, which would actually give us the value of this function at arbitrary points x within an interval where the function is valid or defined. But when we do discrete grid based calculations, the function will be available only at the respective grid points. And therefore, we have to have an equivalent representation of this function in the discrete space. Before we go on to that, we just recall from the previous slides that we had defined wave number like what we have done over here and we also recall that there will be an integer number of periods in the domain of length L irrespective of the wave number that we accommodate and that the wave number varies with this index small n. So, as we said that on a discrete grid we have specific points at which the functional values will be available. So, if we have the function defined at a grid point i, we call it f i and then what we do essentially is that in the index we convert x to x i. So, where x i essentially stands for the x corresponding to the grid point i. Now, we can very easily see from this nomenclature that at x equal to 0, we have the x naught expressed as delta x into 0. At x equal to x 1, we have x 1 equal to delta x into 1 and so on. So, that way we can say that at x i the coordinate will be represented by multiplying delta x by i the grid index. So, likewise f i plus 1 can be represented this way where you have x suffix i plus 1 here in the index and f suffix i plus 1 is nothing but delta x times i plus 1. So, again the grid spacing times the index of that point of that grid point. Similarly, f i minus 1 will be given by an expression like this. So, we need to keep these nomenclatures in mind because when we do the wave number approach calculations all these things that we discussed over the last few minutes will come in very handy. 
So, now let us do a few calculations. We will start off with a calculation where we try to understand that what would be the modified wave number for C D 2 scheme for first order derivative. Of course, we still do not know precisely what we are meaning by modified wave number, but as we do this example, we will understand better that what is the meaning of this whole process. So, we remember that the analytical function that we had defined was f equal to i k f equal to e to the power of i k x. And we are talking about first order derivative. So, if we take the analytical derivative f dash that essentially means del f del x here it will essentially mean d f d x and that will be equal to i k e to the power of i k x. And because e to the power of i k x comes back over here, we can represent it as i k f itself. So, this is the analytical derivative or exact derivative. And now, you can perhaps guess that we will also find an approximate expression for the derivative through our finite difference scheme. So, when we do that, we can call it as say f dash c d 2 and then perhaps compare that how this f dash c d 2 is going to do with respect to the i k f that you have from the analytical part. That is the whole idea. And in the analytical part, we have the wave number figuring here in the expression of f dash. We have to figure out that in the f dash expression that we work out for c d 2, whatever k that comes up is that k exactly equal to the k that we have in the analytical part or it is going to be some other value. The one that will come up in the C D 2 expression, we will mark it as k dash and the idea would be to find out whether k dash is equal to k or not. So, that is the question we are raising at this point. Now, if we manage to find that both the wave numbers are matching, we would be most happy because then what it means is that C D 2 is doing as good a job as the exact derivative. Now, how do we go about finding the f dash for C D 2 scheme? Let us try to put the approximation that we have through the C D 2 scheme and then try to work our way ahead from that point. So, this is the approximation we have for f dash for C D 2 scheme and remember that this f dash is being calculated at point i, the grid point i. So, now it is a matter of just substituting those expressions which we already wrote previously. we take out a common factor again from Euler formula. you can show that the bracketed term in the numerator can be simplified as the 
this. Why is it? Because e to the power of i theta is cos theta plus i sin theta, while e to the power of minus i theta is cos theta minus i sin theta. And therefore, if you take a difference, you are left with 2 i sin theta. So, based on that we can show this to be coming up in the numerator. So, what do we have finally, from this step? We have this may be written as f i Now, we will just rewrite this whole thing in a format which becomes very easy for us to compare with the analytical expression. So, we now recall that the f dash analytical was equal to i times k times f. And through the discrete scheme that we have used over here, we have the i, the f i which is nothing but a counterpart of f and an expression in between which is not the same as k unfortunately and that is the one which we will call as the modified wave number. So, since k and k dash are not the same, it is as though through a numerical means k has been translated to a different expression which involves sin k delta x by delta x. So, that means a wave with a certain wave number or frequency is now having a different frequency associated with it when it is being captured in uh, the discrete calculations using the CD2 finite difference scheme. We will discuss more on this in the next lecture. Thank you.